<laughs> okay. I haven't covered two parts of the lecture, but actually two and a half, let's say. <laughs> so let me conclude. I like this part because I think this is also uh, interesting. So some famous architect said architecture should be based upon principle and not upon precedent. Can anybody guess who this is? I don't have any side channels over here. Unless you watch my lectures online, then you're not allowed to speak. <laughs> no, it's not a Swiss architect. He looks like this, if that helps. No. He built, he didn't build this one. He built this one. Falling water. Yes, Frank Lloyd Wright, exactly. So Frank Lloyd Wright was a very principled person, and he built this and not this. This is precedent-based, what comes before. This is something that he thought it was more principled based on organic architecture. It's sitting on top of the waterfall, imitating that waterfall in a nice way, right? Oh, I don't know what happened there. But, uh, okay, there's a principle over here. Clearly that was, uh, this thing is less costly than this thing. But, <laughs> but uh, what once people go there, it amortizes cost over time. Over long or, well, it, uh, I'm not sure if it's how long. Depends on how well it's used. Okay. <laughs> okay, now that I'm in Switzerland, I don't use that as much. I use this thing, although there was a huge delay today. <laughs> so this is one train station. That's your vanilla train station that exists. Somebody said, told me that it's actually in Germany. I don't care. My, I'll make my point regardless. <laughs> and this is another train station. This is, does anybody know where this is? There's a side channel here. This is Schadelhofen in Zurich. And the first time I went to this train station, that was a different experience. And this is from another principled architect who built this one, who also built this one, who also built this one. Say it again? No. <laughs> I, <laughs> you can probably have the side channel, Santiago Calatrava over here, yes? <laughs> Calatrava. Yeah, so this was actually $4 billion, according to Wikipedia. It cost New Yorkers a lot. You probably know about it. I'm not sure. It's still leaking. <laughs> it's still leaking. There you go. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if this overcame its cost. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, so this is based on another principle. But it's, if you, now, now people go into it and take, take pictures. A lot of people go, go and take pictures. I don't, that's what I know. It's a different level of operation. I think it's still leaking because they didn't pay him enough, no, enough money. At some point, basically, they had to say, stop, we're not paying you more money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I see. I see. <laughs> they didn't pay him enough money either. <laughs> so you need to pay the cost to move to something uh, like processing in memory, otherwise it'll leak. <laughs> that's, the, that's the takeaway, maybe. Anyway. Anyway, so I think uh, the question is, do we have overarching principles of computing? I, I don't claim to have them, but I know that processor-centric design should not be the only principle with which we design systems. And if you actually think that we should design systems somewhat similar or somewhat intelligent, this is not a processor-centric design, in my opinion. And I think science points toward that direction also. So basically, I think it's time to design principled system architectures to solve the memory problem or data movement problem that we have or data, store, data problem in, in general. We want to discover design principles for fundamentally secure and reliable computer architectures and design complete systems to be balanced and energy efficient. And this requires, I think, low latency, which we didn't talk about, and data-centric or memory-centric system design. I think we need to enable new and emerging memory architectures also. I think I've given you some examples. This could lead to orders of magnitude improvements, enable new applications and computing platforms, and perhaps enable a better understanding of nature. Uh, of nature. Uh, so I have one story that I will briefly talk about. Basically, people in psychology were fascinated with computing through the course of the 20th century or late 20th century. And uh, computing was a way of understanding the human. It was a paradigm. It's not that, like that anymore because they quickly figured out that computing works nowhere near to a human today. But maybe if we build something that's uh, more principled and uh, maybe more efficient, because I believe nature is a lot more efficient than what we built today. I don't think nature requires 30, I don't know, weeks of training with very powerful data centers to learn a model. I don't need to see a million examples of cats to decide something's a cat or a dog, right? I may make mistakes, but I don't need to see that many examples. So all those comparisons that we're making with humans and algorithms are kind of unfair, in my opinion. They, they're not taking into account the energy and sustainability factor that is there. So basically, maybe we can enable a better understanding of nature uh, once we actually design better systems. And who knows what else, right? But I think we really need to think across the stack. We can get there step by step. 
And I think I will do one thing, which is uh, talk about a very doubtful emerging technology that was doubtful for decades and decades. And you know what I'm talking about. That has revolutionized our lives, I think. So we've done it before. This thing has it. And this thing exists because of it, which is flash memory, I will say. So flash memory has been very successful, right? It was an emerging technology for decades and decades. And people were actually writing proposals to NSF in 1990s. I know actually I have friends who were doing this, talking about working on garbage collection. I want to go work on garbage collection on flash memories because it's going to be big. And they were getting rejected saying that who cares about this technology? It's not important. But because of this technology, I can carry this laptop all the time, right? With the, with the, with the amount of capacity that it has, of course. And if you go to Flash Memory Summit, they actually have this timeline. Uh, clearly, it starts from 1967, as you can see over here. But a lot of activity started in Flash Memory, especially around here. So it takes time to actually change the paradigm. And Flash Memory, it didn't even change the paradigm, right? It fit nicely in an existing paradigm. But in many ways, it was more difficult. I think from a technology perspective, the manufacturing perspective, flash memory is definitely much more difficult than processing in memory. No question about that, because it's really trying to enable a completely different technology, make it mass manufacturable. So, but in, in, from an integration and system level perspective, it, it was much easier than processing in memory, for example, because it fit nicely into the model that we have. Even though using it exactly with the storage model that we have for hard disk is probably a bad idea, and people have figured it out quickly, over time, and they're hopefully pulling away from that. Uh, but still, it fit nicely. Programs still work that way. I think, I think of processing in memory, or changing the paradigm with a method like processing in memory, in terms of manufacturing, it's much harder, at least in the full-blown processing in memory, not like the role clone type of processing in memory. Uh, but from an adoption perspective, it's much harder than flash memory. So it's kind of a different beast that we need to enable. OK, I think we'll not do the detour because the detour is exactly the same thing that we did over here. So I have redundancy in my slides. If we, don't, if we skip in some place, we can go back to some place. <laughs> okay. So that's all I have. I'd be happy to chat more.